this is going to be slightly different from the previous keynotes where I'm literally just going to follow a single protein target to everything we did to it to get actually our structural information, which is at the end of the day what we really wanted. Um, so effectively this project, it started even before I came to Paul Nissen's lab as a postdoc. It actually preceded me and it continues now in my lab that is just set up here at Aarhus. And we learned a lot about pretty much ourselves, the protein, and how, actually how we do structural biology by tackling this. And for me, one of the things was what to do when you cannot get good crystals. And um, so as you can assume from the title, we actually turned to cryo-EM. But as an overview of the talk, um, because a lot of the, um, how to say, strategies that we employed in the downstream processing of the sample actually relate to the protein function, I want to give an, up, an overview of lipid flipases and then how we actually went around tackling the project and the problems and the questions we wanted to answer. So um, as many of you know, the eukaryotic membrane is quite complex. And one of the complexities is the non-random distribution of lipids across the membrane. So if you would just focus on the plasma membrane, for example, you would have an enrichment of single myelin in PC in the outer leaflet of the membrane, whereas the anionic lipids, PS and PI, are sequestered in the inner leaflet, along with uh, phosphatidin and ethanolamine. And this is not by chance. Elements are actually established through uh, lipid synthesis, but it still requires um, a variety of protein machinery to actually maintain and establish this lipid asymmetry. Um, there is three different protein families that move lipid across the membrane. You have the scramblases, which drive bidirectional movement across the membrane. They're typically calcium activated. You have the lipid floppases, which are from the ABC transporter family that drive the extracellular or the export of lipid to the outer leaflet. And you have the so-called lipid flipases, which drive the inward. Um, how to say the inward directed translocation. Um, both the lipid flipases and flopases are powered by ATP and the lipid flipases belong to quite a, a broad family of membrane transporters called P-type ATPases. Um, they're all further complicated by the fact that most of them require an accessory subunit from the CDC50 family to actually be expressed and properly localized to its correct membrane. As I mentioned, the transporting unit is a P-type ATPase, also called the pump, mainly from their, um, their role as ion pumps. So sodium potassium pump and the sarcoplasmic and sarcoendoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPases are very, very um, prominent members of this family. And lipid asymmetry actually is very important. So it first of all serves to um, define different compartments or different chemistries for the uh, membrane surface. So if you have a, um, how to say, a, a large concentration of negative charged lipids on the inner leaflet, this serves as a docking site for polybasic uh, proteins um, to actually recruit onto the membrane surface. Um, through its uh, role as a lipid transporter, it can actually form lo uh, induced local membrane curvature which gives rise to nascent vesicle formation. Uh, movement of lipids across the membrane are very prominent in uh, lipid signaling. For example, surface exposure of PS triggers a variety of uh, biological processes, chief amongst them blood coagulation and apoptosis. And this regulation of this asymmetry actually has detrimental uh, effects on the membrane. So we decided to look at a well-characterized um, organism, in this case, uh, sarcoplasm, uh, sorry, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And uh, we're looking at the lipid flipases in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And they actually it expresses five different um, P4 ATPases or lipid flipases. So DNF1, DNF2 are plasma membrane localized. They have a beta subunit called LEM3, and they have a substrate specificity ranging from PC, lyso-PC, and also glucosylceramide. Uh, DNF3 is localized to the Golgi. It itself has substrate specificity for phosphatidylcholine and phosphatidylethanolamine. Neo1 is the, um, how to say, the black sheep of the family in the context that it does not require a beta subunit uh, 
for localization. And you will hear more about this protein tomorrow when, when you'll have a presentation by Lina Marie Christensen, also from Paul Nissen's lab. It is localized to the Galgi and the substrate specificity is un unknown. However, there are direct evidence for indirect evidence for PE translocation. Uh, DRS2, it's beta subunit as I meant, is, uh, from the, is CDC 50P. It's localized to the trans Galgi and early endosomes and has a substrate specificity of a uh, phosphatidylserine and phosphatidyl ethanolamine. And it was the anionic lipid transporter, DRS2P, that we actually decided to focus on in this study. So um, this is work that we've actually been in a long-term and very fruitful collaboration with the lab of Guillaume Lenoir at CEA Saclay. And they actually generated the protein constructs, uh, or at least the parent protein construct used in this study. We've made some modifications ourselves along the way for specific, uh, to answer specific questions. And actually, so this is a plasmid that we can use uh, based on the PYDP60 backbone that we use for homologous expression of DRS2 in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And actually, we not only ex both express um, DRS2, but also CDC50 on the, on the same plasmid. DRS2 is actually exists as a fusion with a C-terminal bad tag that can be cleaved. And the CDC50 actually has a his tag if we require orthogonal purification or just a way of uh, detecting the protein using blotting. Um, the strains that we were initially using actually were quite unique and um, they were actually generated, uh, oh, sorry, the technology we were using was actually quite unique and it was generated by Guillaume uh, back in 2002, if I recall. And it required, so the plasmid has been modified to also include GAL, the expression of GAL4 behind a galactose-inducible promoter, which we also use to uh, express DRS2. And the mindset behind this is um, overexpression of the GAL4 transcription factor would serve to boost um, expression of our gene of interest. And this is actually the technology that was used very early in the expression of uh, circa. So the calcium ATP is in Saccharomyces that uh, Roslyn mentioned this morning. So this is, this is the technology used to actually express the first mem uh, recombinant membrane protein in yeast in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, we also looked at a PEP4 deleted strain and I will mention a little bit more about that uh, in the next slide about why we needed this. And the expression system itself is actually relatively straightforward. We did uh, pre-cultures in uh, minimal media, whereas our main grow-ups were actually using uh, rich media. So the um, we have 36 hours at 28 degrees, and we actually use a two-step induction for to induce overexpression of our protein of interest, in this case, DRS2. So we have, after 36 hours, a first induction with 2% galactose, Temperature is reduced to 18 degrees for expression. And then we give it, after 12 hours, another 2% um, uh, galactose before harvesting the uh, cells after about five, five to six hours and um, isolating the membranes. And we actually use glass beads in a, uh, how to say, a rock miller to actually lyse the cells. Um, the construct I mentioned had a bad tag fused to the C terminus, and this was actually cleaved by trombin. Um, trombin came with its own uh, unique um, difficulties in the fact that it also actually cleaved the first 104 amino acids from DRS2, which, as the initial plan for this project was crystallography, we actually thought this was not a bad thing. And also, when we expressed a variant that did not cleave at uh, N terminus, we saw no difference in the activity. So the removal of these 104 amino acids had no effect on the actual activity of the protein, at least that we could detect. Um, so when uh, Miriam, uh, who's a postdoc in the lab, and uh, Christina during her master's actually tried to express this construct in um, Saccharomyces, we saw that the GAL4 strain, or the GAL4, um, strain also actually had a, um, a new effect, if you will. Um, well, it had a 
we get overexpression of the protein. You have the P2 and P3 membranes. The P2 membranes are the membrane pellet we actually isolate at 20,000 uh, G, where the P3 membranes are those we isolate at, uh, in the ultracentrifuge, if you will. And as you can see, both membranes contain the protein of interest, but we also have a significant amount of unglycosylated or partially glycosylated CDC50. Whereas in the Delta PEP4 strain, um, we actually, the yield was a little bit more reduced, but we were able to get the fully glycosylated CDC50. So we decided going forward, it was better to have the more homogeneous sample. We also did detect um, some truncation of the protein. However, when we purify downstream, we, we lose the lower bands because it, it seems to be a C-terminal truncation of the construct um, or not solubilized. Um, in terms of purification, it's a very, very simple procedure. We use DDM to extract the RS2P from the um, membrane. So we end up with uh, DDM solubilized protein, which we then batch bind to streptavidin resin. So the bad tag is uh, the biotinylated acceptor domain. It's biotinylated in vivo in yeast. And Saccharomyces cerevisiae is actually quite good in the fact that I think there's only three other proteins that are natively biotinylated in Saccharomyces. So in terms of background for binding onto the resin, there is not a huge amount of protein that we have to compete with. However, as the interaction between streptavidin and biotin is incredibly strong, there is no way to elute the sample. So we chose to effectively cleave the protein from the resin. But once bound to the resin, we're actually able to we lipidate the sample if we need to and actually do detergent exchange as we didn't have to worry about the protein leaching from the column. Um, Trombin cleavage released our protein as um, a matured version of our protein that lacks 104 residues at the end terminus, which we can then use downstream for biochemistry and structural studies. And in terms of yield, I look back to the notes. I think in our hands, depending on the construct, we obtain something between 0.5 to 1 milligrams of pure protein. And I mean, after size exclusion per liter of culture. So um, in terms of biochemistry, it had already been established that this protein is activated in a way by interaction with phosphonizotide uh, for phosphate. It can interact with others, but the strongest uh, or the most significant activation is with PI4P. Um, this is a typical purification or at least purity of the DRS2 sample after the bad tag. So on one hand, it is a very costly method for producing uh, protein because you cannot regenerate the resin. But as DRS2 was so well expressing, we didn't have to use a, lot of, a large amount of uh, resin to trap the protein. So it actually became a trade-off between getting good quality pure protein and um, the cost of the resin and the protein one in this context given what we were using it for. Um, here you can also see that uh, in detergent alone, with, without PI4P, the protein is not active, even when we give it its substrate. This is work from Guillaume's lab summarized in this paper. And once you add PI4P, you get a market, um, how to say, interaction, uh, sorry, activity. And we measure activity to the liberation of phosphate by the ATPase domains in the, in, the, in the transporter. So we don't directly monitor lipid movement here in my cells, more the um, ATP turnover of the protein, which should be coupled to lipid transport. So phosphatidylserine is clearly the substrate of choice and it needs PF4P for activation. And we'll come back to this concept later. Um, so we decided to, at the start, we wanted to crystallize a protein. Paul's lab itself is a, quite a famous and prominent uh, protein by um, structure biology lab, but, uh, and they've also developed their own method for crystallizing membrane proteins. I came from a background of lipidic cubic phase with Martin Caffrey, so we tried that method also, and we were trying to make a lipid-based method work. We ended up also trying other insurful methodologies, however, nothing really worked well for us. So highlight is a high lipid, high detergent method, um, in this case, we add a high amount of, so we use the high amount of detergent in the protein sample to solubilize a lipid film that has been evaporated on the 
base of a glass vial or a glass tube. And this, these lipid detergent protein mixes can then undergo crystallization. And like the lipid cubic phase, we typically would get these layered stacking of crystals. This is the method, at least what the method generates when we set up crystallization. And indeed, we had very nice beers and jumping up and down when we got our first crystals. And we brought them to the synchrotron. So you can see these are quite small crystals. I think they're about 20 micron in diameter. And we mounted them on a, I think it was, this is a diamond uh, light source. And the best diffraction we could see would extend to about 14 angstroms. And no matter what we tried to the protein, um, the crystallization conditions, the lipidation ratios, we could not actually move this um, beyond 14 angstroms. And I must say at this point, the protein was in element G. Um, so moving uh, forward, we were trying to think what wasn't working. So one of the uh, elements of DRS2, it has quite a long C terminus. Um, I think it extends by about 110 residues, 105 residues. And in that domain, there is meant to be a lipid binding site. Uh, at the time, there was a vision to be a lipid binding site, namely the PI4P was meant to bind the C-terminus. And there was an order regulation site for the protein. So together with Guillaume, uh, and he's a very talented lab, we decided to look at first limited proteolysis to get a sense of how much can we cut off the protein by exposing it to a variety of different um, uh, proteases. And this is just one example. We used chymotrypsin and trypsin, but this is one example with just thrombin, where you can see the parent protein. So this is actually a different construct, which had an N-terminal tag. So you purify um, the full protein and it was cleaved with TEV. So we didn't have any nascent cleavage of the N-terminus. When we expose to the thrombin, you get a very rapid cleavage of uh, the N terminus, at, at, so the first 104 amino acids leave. Oops. Um, and also, we get a slight a presence of a slight lower band. When you increase the um, incubation time, we really didn't change the ratio. Maybe you can say we got this lower band a little bit more. But actually, once we added PI4P, we got a marked reduction of the upper band to this. Uh, lower uh, molecular weight species, which comprised based on mass spec residue 105 to 1290. And so this was, this residue was actually even after the proposed autoinhibitory site. And what we could also see was based on dephosphorylation that this um, very low cleaved uh, fragment was actually the most active form of the protein as in it is the one that was the most readily um, dephosphorylated. And these were using uh, radioactive ATP. And of course, the truncated uh, sample over here was the most active. And what kind of struck us as remarkable at the time was it still required PI4P for activation, but the overall activity was a lot higher, meaning that uh, it was right. We were actually previously only detecting the activity of a very, very small subpopulation of cleave protein in our actual measurements or matured protein in our uh, ATPs measurements. So uh, because we could not uh, use limited proteolysis to cleave the C-terminus uh, further, we then tried to actually just engineer a construct. So here is our Delta N104 construct where we had thrombin cleave at both the N-terminus and C-terminus. And we decided to modify it to include another thrombin cleavage site. And uh, we, we, look, we put this um, site very quite close to the, um, to the C-terminal end of TM10. I think it was around the, uh, yeah, it was a residue 1247. So we remove all um, the PI4P binding motif or the proposed PI4P binding motif and the autoregulation of the autoregulatory site. And indeed this double truncated construct was more active than uh, Delta N104, so this species up here. And also, it still required PI4P, and that baffled us because the reported site was meant to be now removed. So this opened up questions of where is PI4P now binding in the protein? And um, so 
we needed to actually get more structured information. And this gave us quite a nice tool now where we actually have a construct where we don't have an auto, auto inhibitory domain. So we can now between our constructs start trying to map the transport cycle of the protein with a focus on the uh, auto inhibition and regulation. So um, as I mentioned, crystallization studies didn't um, work out as well as we hoped. So what could we do? So we knew we had the protein solubilized in DDM and we knew we could actually exchange that to LMNG with, uh, with no impact on at least function to, that we could detect. And it was still quite well behaved based on gel filtration. We get a monomeric protein and using uh, negative steam EM, we were getting predominantly monomer um, as a result, but we we're also detecting some um, dimer uh, formation. However, the predominant species was monomer. So this was one avenue we could exploit. Around the, this was around the time of the resolution revolution. So this gives you a time frame for when we were actually tackling this. And um, this is right off the back of Shore Shares publishing the beta galactose, uh, sorry, uh, beta gamma secretase um, structure. And in their paper, they actually used amphipulse to um, act as a non detergent like micelle across, around the protein. And we actually established a exchange for DDM into amphipulse where we just incubated the protein with an excess of amphipulse and used uh, bio beads to actually remove the excess detergent. And we're able to get very nice stable um, particles and amphipoles, which we actually were able to turn into 3D reconstructions using negative stain that approximated the size of our protein. And indeed, um, we also looked at um, membrane-based nanodisks. So in this case, I looked at solipro nanodisks to try and generate a version of the protein that is in a membrane environment. Because if you remember, these proteins are not only regulated by lipids, but they're also transport lipids. So we thought using a lipid-based approach would give us the best chance of actually trapping such a complex. So based on EM, sorry, negative stain EM analysis, we couldn't quite determine which sample to go forward with. And based on timing, we decided to look at the amphipulse sample first. And I will not say this is the best grid, but it's actually one of the better images we had for the sample. And to a lot of very uh, hard work by Milena uh, in collaboration with Arna Moller, who was originally at Aarhus University, but moved to the Max Planck in Frankfurt at, the, at that period of time, uh, we're able to get the best resolution we could get was around five angstrom. And that was a global EM resolution. Uh, there was regions of the protein that were a little bit better, but most of the re regions were a lot worse than five angstroms, meaning the novel building would have been a challenge. So we could have, um, approximated the ATPase domain or the ATPase subunit based on published structures of circa um, heavy metal pumps, sodium potassium pump. However, the beta subunit here would be de novo. Um, so we needed more, uh, more information to actually help us drive model building. So um, at this time, we were actually shipping the protein to Frankfurt and they were making grids. And we decided to try and do it ourselves because we had our own vitrobot and our, our microscope slowly came online with a K2 camera. And actually during the course of our optimizations, we actually noticed that the LMNG sample was by far the best sample we had. Um, so we actually put this on a grade. We only needed really low concentrations. So we were taking it from the column at about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 mix per mil. Uh, as the peak fraction, we concentrated perhaps even twofold to get the concentration you needed to see this particle density here, which is quite remarkable in this context. And I think it's uh, a testament to the low CMC uh, of the LMNG. Even from the 2D classifications, we're able to see elements of secondary structure for a protein that got us giddy with excitement. I won't go into that. And we're able to see uh, all the features that we would expect of our protein. And this is work that was summarized quite beautifully in a nature paper, but also equally more impressive in Melina's PhD thesis, where we're able to actually solve the first structures of the lipid flippase. And uh, if you indulge me for a couple of slides, I want to show how we, what we learned from the protein and also how we modified our experiments going forward. 
And as you can see, you have the CDC 50 in pink, the transmembrane domain in TAM, phosphorylation domain, which actually gets transiently trans phosphorylated during the transport, the actuator domain, which drives the phosphorylation, and the nucleotide binding domain, which of course binds ATP for phosphorylation. And in green here, we actually resolve the autoregulatory part of the C terminus. Um, not only did we get this auto inhibited form, because EM, we didn't have to make crystals. Once you have a good condition, we actually can exploit different conformational states. We got an intermediate resolution for a intermediate complex, if you will, where we tried to just add PI4P to see could we destabilize the auto inhibitory domain. And actually just adding PI4P on its own did not um, give us the desired effect. So we actually went back to this C terminally truncated construct I mentioned earlier that we made for crystal studies that amounted to uh, no better crystals than 14 angstrom. So what we could actually see was um, we were able to trap this at a very uh, good resolution that allowed the NOVA building. Um, subsequently, Malena has now actually captured most of the rest of the states in the transport cycle. And actually this paper came online on um, Friday in JMB. So if you want to see how this protein uh, binds lipids and how it, reset, how it actually gets phosphorylated, th these states are now present in, um, a, in this JMB paper. So in terms of what we saw, we actually were able to resolve the autoregulatory domain. And we're also able to um, show uh, that, okay, so this has a motif, um, this, this motif here, that is roughly conserved in a select human variants. And actually subsequent structures of ATP 8A1 from the Nareki lab actually supported the binding um, pose of the C-terminus against the uh, P, A, and N domains. In particular, this, these aromatic residues sampled the ATP binding pocket, thus arresting the ATPase activity of the protein. What was also interesting is we actually found that the binding site for PI4P was not present on a disordered part of the C-terminus, but actually integral to the protein. So we actually see a binding between the CDC50 subunit and TM10 and the core of the protein. And what was interesting is it actually served to order or at least maybe fold, but definitely order a amphipatic helix of this uh, that is present on the C terminus. And selection for the four phosphate is actually via both this tyrosine and histidine residue. So these were mutations done by our collaborator, and we could actually see that um, it completely abolished uh, ATP, uh, ATPase activity, even in the presence of PI4P, in, inferring that these were what was making uh, this selective PI4P. So uh, as you noticed, I didn't talk about the transported substrate. And the best we got from our structural studies was the truncated form of the protein gave us an open configuration. So this is um, something we trapped with a phosphate analog called beryllium fluoride. And this actually arrested the protein in a conformation where TM2 has moved away from the helical bundle here to make an opening for lipid binding. However, we did not resolve any lipids in the cavity, even though we actually provided them. So this begged the question, how can we push this? Um, so bear in mind, this was before the um, papers from the Nareki lab. So we decided to look at, as I mentioned, nanodis reconstitution. Um, in this case, we used Solipro, which was, came from uh, Jens Fraunfeld, I think when he was at the Karolinska. And the technology is really reliant on the binding of supposing A, so it's lipid binding properties, to uh, bind lipids that surround the membrane protein. In this case, we actually pre-incubate the protein with a mixed micelle of lipids and detergents. So the lipids, in this case, brain polar lipid extract, will equilibrate with our protein of interest. I chose brain polar lipid extract because it was a blend of lipids, but was also quite enriched in phosphatidylserine, which is the preferred substrate for the, uh, for the protein uh, that we were studying. And when we incubate these lipid detergent uh, mixes with the protein, we subsequently add supposing A, then we dilute the sample to below the CMC, concentrate 
and um, inject for size exclusion. And this is a typical uh, preparative scale um, reconstitution for another lipid flipase. So this is the bovine ATP82, which is an ortholog of uh, DRS2. I have similar, um, how to say, chromatograms also for DRS2, but the subsequent story that I'm going to show, I do not have that data yet for EM. So we are able to get a stable and complex. There was a monomeric peak. Negative stain analysis was good, as was uh, cryoanalysis. So you can actually see here, we have the similar features for the monomeric protein in a, uh, in a nanodisc. So this is the data that we have. It's roughly around 2.4 angstrom for the structure, which is substrate bound. You can see the, all the features that I talked about before with p-type ATPases, and they're color coded as previously. So you have the ATPase domains here in yellow, blue, and red. The CDC50 protein is in pink, and the actual lipid, the PS, is here in green. So you can actually see it's um, penetrating the cavity that's formed um, between TM2 and the bulk, um, the, hel the bulk helical bundle of the transporter. And so it's predominantly only the head group that's encapsulated. And likely that makes sense because the uh, specificity is conferred by the head group. And the atrial change remain continuous with the membrane uh, during transport. And this uh, figure over here, you can see the extent of the nano disc. So it's actually quite a tight nano disc around the protein. And it, there is also partial ordering of the supposing molecules in the nanodisks, but not enough to model them uh, convincingly. Um, so I think uh, in closing, I can show that DRS2 and CDC50 is being overexpressed in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. We get modest but yields for structural studies. Um, for definite EM, it's more than enough. Crystallography required large scale expression. It can be purified by a bad tag, which is cleaved from the streptavidin resin. And we evaluated a number of different mem membrane memetics for DRS2 and related proteins for structural studies. And in terms of the biology of the um, target, we actually provided the first structural insights into autoregulation. We have now moved into looking at how substrate is bound and how the transport mechanism actually, um, how it undergoes transport for these substrates. And um, of course, uh, this project was a testament to the collaborations. So first you have Paul's lab. I'd like to definitely mention Milena, who I pointed at a number of times. Jacob uh, also started the project about a year before and he was focusing a lot on the crystallization. So a lot of the optimization and, and uh, engineering was actually done in Jacob's hands. Uh, Miriam actually was the postdoc who previously had and Milena Marie is working on other lipid phases together with Paul and myself. And she will talk tomorrow. Um, our project is, was built through a very strong collaboration with the lab of Guillaume Lenoir, C.A. Saclay. I would like to highlight Cedric and especially Thibault. Some of the slides are even from Thibault today. And uh, Thibault is actually currently in Aarhus uh, working with Paul. And of course, the latter part I wanted to show was our collaboration with um, uh, Jens Peter Anderson in biomedicine on the uh, bovine lipid flippase. Microscopy was done between um, how to say the Max Planck for biophysics in Frankfurt with Werner Kubrant and Anna Muller. And uh, a lot of it was actually done together with Deville, uh, postdoc in Arna's lab. And EM at home is done under the direction of Thomas Bosen, who's our EM facility manager. Um, Ramon is maintaining the microscope. And Jesper, if anyone knows Jesper, you know that you cannot do any structural studies without Jesper. Um, he maintains all our computation here at Aarhus. Um, we also had initial screening at the microscopy uh, facility at uh, Copenhagen and the results I didn't show, but we have some nice uh, molecular dynamic studies on substrate specificity done by young Matt Wang when he was with uh, Kristen Lindof Lawson. As a shameless plug, my lab is actually open for business. So if anyone's interested in doing a postdoc, let me know. And I thank you all again for your uh, attention and forthcoming questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for that very interesting journey through the one flippase journey. We have a few questions here. Um, Saba wants to know, can you comment a bit more on relipidation the, uh, of the brown protein? Uh, uh, so, how it affected uh, the activity yeah. of the complex? Uh, okay, um, how it affected the activity? is very hard to 
tease out the X because we actually just e equilibrated it with um, phosphatidylserine, just a small amount of phosphatidylserine to and help preserve at least to what we saw early in in our early experiments and the stability of the protein. But uh, as it went on, once we improved and optimized the expression, we could actually do this step without limitation. So we just added back a small amount of PS. If I recall, uh, there were two and a half lipid samples. I, I would be surprised if there was a lipid molecule per micelle based on those numbers. Um, I think it was a very, very trace amount of PS. And as PS was always present, then the substrate, the basal activity of the protein will always be a little higher than without substrate, of course. Um, hopefully that helped. We also equilibrated with PI4P and there we actually used quite a lot because we needed PI4P to, um, so we pre, when we had the engineered construct with the multiple thrombin sites, we first cleaved it off the protein, uh, sorry, cleaved the protein off the resin captured that and then incubated with a large excess of PI4P to be able to destabilize the autoinhibitory domain for subsequent further cleavage. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and then you have PI4P presence and there, it was quite slow to diffuse in LMNG. So it was always going to be affect the activity of the compounds. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one mm -hmm. more question. Um, Martin Caffrey wants to know, do you ever lose the accessory protein? Um, Good question. Um, to our extensive EM analysis, we have never found a protein that was lacking CDC50. I don't know if that is a direct answer for the question. They also don't stain equally on SDS page, so it's hard to quantify based on just simple SDS page analysis. But based on our handling of the protein, our experience with gel filtration and the variety of negative stain and cryo-EM studies, We've never seen just the isolated um, pump, if you will. So uh, I can, I would say with some confidence, we never use the CDC 50 subunit. Um, Saba asks, how is the EM behavior of the complex salipro sample? Really, really good. Um, so we were able to use concentrations that were even slightly lower than DRS2 in LMNG. So we're freezing. So this is total protein concentration of 0.4 mg per mil and we're getting similar density of particles. Mm -hmm. And uh, the lipid types we used was brain polar lipids. You can buy them from a, a Sigma. So it's, I think it was the Fulch type four fraction. It was the original lipids used in the supposing methodology from Jens Fraunfeld. Yeah. Yeah. Then, yeah. Then can you Thank shortly you. elaborate the methods to identify native lipids as this would be the primary requirement for highlight method? If I um, correct. Yeah, that's a good question. We actually didn't look at evaluating native lipids, um, but uh, we do have an ongoing collaboration with Carl Robinson where we can actually look at native lipids uh, that at least co purify with the protein. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the actual lipids we use to screen, we primarily looked at uh, phosphatidylcholine, so either native extracts of soy PC or the synthetic DOPC. As a as a, at least a basal lipid for highlight, we then depending on the how to say conformational state we were looking for, we added the substrate and our regulatory lipids to the mix, but um, we always have kept the background of PC. Okay. I think we even tried brain polar lipids at one point, and nothing came from it. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Joseph, for your contribution to the links okay. workshop. Thank you.